Good morning. Good morning. I know we're a little slim this morning, and I'm sure it has something to do with the, uh, the virus that's out there, but I'm so grateful that you're here this morning. And I, I thought before I began just to let you know that, that I'm okay with the, the greet one another with a holy kiss, or if you want a hug, or do a fist bump, or an elbow bump, I'm good with live long and prosper, or even a nanu nanu. So uh, it doesn't matter, I'm just so grateful that we can be here together to worship God in spirit and in truth. And so uh, I hope that you feel the same way. Uh, in 1 John uh, chapter 2, uh, we will continue what we've been studying. You know, I was uh, pondering uh, the idea of calling an audible. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in light of the fear, let's just call it what it is, there seems to be a great deal of fear in the world about what's going on. And I thought, well, you know, some kind of message about comfort and calm would be good. And, uh, and when I started thinking about it, and, and, you know, where we are, we can draw a great deal of comfort and calm from. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the, the Apostle John and what he wrote for us in his account of the Gospel. Uh, spent a lot of time studying that. And even in 1 John, and what I, you know, when I began to reflect about that, I'm thinking, Kirk, will you nut, you know? Think about what John's been trying to tell us. The whole idea is to, to be calm. It's going to be okay. As long as we, as 1 John chapter 1 says, walk in the light as he is in the light. Everything's going to be just fine. I would like to say, as far as, as it goes, as Christians, we've kind of got a one-up on everybody else. And, uh, and I, if you're a Christian and you're here this morning, I, I think you feel the same way. Uh, because there's a great deal of comfort that we have in God's Word. In fact, we think of Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 where Paul was writing there and he says <clears throat> this. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, and he's speaking about the Scriptures, uh, these were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And so as much as that was written, uh, reflecting on the Old Testament Scriptures as a, an element of comfort and hope, uh, I'm not sure that he knew at that time that what he was writing would develop into what we consider as the New Covenant, the Scriptures, and we continue to have comfort and hope in these words. So when we take a look at uh, 1 John, I wanted to back up to verse 17 because there I think is, is one of the key ideas and messages that we need to understand in light of actually verses 17 through 19. Listen, the world passeth away. And in the Greek there, it's not only the idea that that it is passing away now. It always has been passing away. It has been passing away. It continues to pass away. And the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now there should be a lot of comfort in that very statement. Because what it's talking about there is the, the everlasting abiding that we will have uh, as this world passes away. And he continues on there in verse 18 as he says, Little children, we've already addressed that before. He says, It is the last time. Now, I have to go back and tell you once again about the things that I face in the place that I work. People are always talking about, could this be the last days? Could this be the last time because of all of this pestilence and the, this virus and so forth? And John is telling us right here when he's writing, we're, he was in the last time. We're in the last time. Folks, the world needs to get this straight. And I think if we would be able to understand and wrap our... I'm saying the world, not necessarily us. If they could just wrap their minds around... We've been in this last time since John's day. And they think that there's some kind of antichrist coming. And what is it that John tells us? Was John out of his mind? Was the apostle John, was he uninspired? He didn't know what he was talking about? Of course not. He knew exactly what he was talking about. And here he's writing to us to provide, well, comfort to the listeners of his day, 
Because they had a great deal of persecution they were about to face. And so what we face is, is different. It's not like the persecution that they face, but yet it's troublesome. But if we have our faith in God's Word, just like John is telling us, we're going to be okay. Little children, it is the last time. This is it. And as you have heard, the Antichrist will come, or shall come, even now are there Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. John was not out of his mind. He was just helping the people of his day understand this is it. There's not going to be another dispensation, another time, and, uh, and we don't know. Nobody knows uh, the time of the, the final day. Even Jesus himself, we've, we've said this before, he didn't know. He said only the Father knows. And he's going to flip the switch at the appropriate time. So what does that say? We just need to be ready. But in the meantime, we don't need to have fear run our lives. Yeah, I, <laughs> We went shopping. I bet some of you have gone shopping this week. And it just it amazes me, the commodity of toilet paper. <laughs> wow. I was telling Lori, I said, I wish I'd had the, the foresight. I would have invested in the toilet paper company. <laughs> Be very rich right now. But that's not what it's all about. But it's just, it's, let me use the, the term wacky, you know. But when I was thinking about it, because, you know, it said, well, you know, what if we get quarantined? Do we have enough toilet paper? That does actually run through your mind. And I got to thinking about that, and I, and I, I had this moment where I said, you know what, if... If things really get bad, I'm not going to worry because I truly believe that as a collective group of brethren, we will rest upon each other. And we'll find a way. We will, all, we will find a way to work it through. And I believe that because of my faith in God. And so I'm hoping I'm sharing that faith with you and that we feel the same way. We're going to be just fine. And we don't need to think that, well, is this the last day? Is there going to be, is the Antichrist about to come upon us? Because that is exactly what John is trying to describe to the people there. Look at verse 19. They, that is those that were Antichrist, those who were against Christ, who spoke openly against Christ, they went out from among us, but they were not of us. Uh, if For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us, but they went out. Notice that these words are italicized. These words are therefore supplied by the translators to help further our understanding and bring it together uh, for the Greek rendering. Uh, so it just helps us to understand that they of their own volition decided, look, I'm, they didn't want to be a part of us. They went out that they might be made manifest, that they were made openly, came forth, and it came to our understanding that they were not all of us. Alright? Because if they had been, they would be remaining. And so he's talking about this idea of abiding. Now, verses 20 and following, just, just not enough time uh, that, that I wanted to... There needs to be some extra time spent on the particular words that are there. But even from 20 and following, there's a great sense of comfort that we should render from that. But I want to just take the, the idea, the word abide, and let's talk about the word abide uh, this morning. Now we remember John is the writer. Now where would John uh, ever have come up with uh, using this word abide? I'm going to draw our minds back to a study that we had back in John chapter 15. And we're, we're not going to go necessarily back over that, but let's read that portion of Scripture to help further our understanding. Because John, if there's one thing we know about John, is he likes to pull from previous writings that he had there in, uh, in his gospel account of John. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And we'll read a good portion of this. It says, I am, that is Jesus says, I am, ego eimi, the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Now, let's just stop there. As much as John was saying those that were antichrist were not among us, they, they were made manifest, look at what he's saying. The branches that didn't bring forth fruit, 
the husbandman cast away. He, he chopped them off. He got rid of those. Maybe they were diseased or defective. I, I don't know. The point is, they weren't bearing fruit. But those that were bearing fruit, they were, they were taken care of. They were purged. They were pruned, if you will, uh, so that they could bring forth more fruit. I, I don't know a lot about gardening, but I know enough that the, like, um, the folks who want to... You know, you've seen those big, gigantic pumpkins? You ever seen those? That they have to push around and, well, you know, two, three hundred pound pumpkins, maybe even bigger. You know how they, they get that? Is they, they look at all of the blooms that they've had that are on a particular vine. And then what they're going to do is they're going to purge that vine of all the smaller fruit so that they don't take away from the nourishment that that better fruit can provide. And that's exactly the idea. It's being purged. They're taking away, you know, the, the poor looking pumpkins and that poor pumpkin. It's no good. They just cast it out. Right? And then you get these big gigantic pumpkins. Well, it's no different for the Christian. He's spending time uh, trying to make us produce even more. That's what it says. Bring forth more fruit. Now you are dead. Or I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoops. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Right? You're clean through the word. And, and we understand what this means by way of furthering our understanding of the New Testament. How are we cleansed through His Word? Well, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We repent of our sins. We're baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. We resurrect to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. There's a host of, of verses about that. But I gather most of us uh, of an accountable age understand that process. We've gone through that. We're clean through the Word because we've acted upon that Word. Now... Verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. So again, I think he's helping us understand that if we're going to have this eternal abiding, we have to be in Christ. Now I know there are some religious groups that like to say, well, this is how we, we render or reckon the idea of denominations, right? Because there's uh, Jesus is the vine and there's all these branches and the branches represent these different religious groups. Nothing could be further from the truth because when you look at the Greek, he's talking to individuals, not groups of people as vines. We are each part of the main vine. We are the branches as individuals, right? And uh, each one of us has to bear fruit. We are going to be, each one of us, held accountable. If we don't, we will be cut off as individuals. And he says that we need to abide in the vine. We, if we don't abide in Him, well, let's read on. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Nothing. If a man... See, this is how we know he's talking about individuals. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Uh, I think we get the point, right? So for us to, to consider what John is writing in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17 about this abiding eternally, for us to abide eternally, to have that comfort, the world's passing away, but for us to ab abide, as it says here, uh, forever, then we're going to have to understand what abiding in Christ means. And so that's the meat or the body of the lesson. First of all, abiding means to dwell in or to continue in. Alright? The word abide is used in the Gospel account of John 33 times and in 1 John 18 times. That's why I think it's so important for us to, to grasp the idea of abiding or continuing or dwelling in. And so what does this mean? Well, uh, perhaps the first um, verse I want us to turn to outside of the, the John writings is what we read in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Paul puts it like this. He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
In other words, He is abiding. He is continuing. He is dwelling in you. Now, we're not talking about a personal indwelling, right? But He dwells in us by the way that we portray ourselves in the world. Through His Word, right? Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. In other words, Christ lives in us. He abides in us by faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, I want us to turn over and read that as well. There's several, several different passages I, I'm hoping we can take a look at. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. He says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And when we think about putting that old man away, again, I think about baptism, right? Because that's, that's the very illustration that's used in Romans chapter 6. Going down into that watery grave, putting that old man of sin to death. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 says that we walk in him, we continue in him, and therefore he continues in us. Now here's another aspect about being or abiding in Christ. Let's turn over to the first chapter of Ephesians for just a moment. The first chapter of Ephesians. Because we understand that through baptism... Uh, based on Acts chapter 2, when we are baptized, we are added to the Lord's kingdom, His church. You know, right there in that whole passage it says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Alright? So, uh, if He's adding to the church, we better get some more understanding. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, it says, and hath put all things under His feet, that is, Christ's feet, gave Him to be the head over all things to the church. That is the collective gathering, the congregation of the Lord's people, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. In other words, we are in His body. We are in His kingdom. Uh, we might take a look at Colossians chapter 1, uh, and specifically, I want to take a look at verse 18. There it says, And He is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things we might have, we might have the preeminence. That's why I say, friends, as Christians, as members of the body of Christ, we're one up on everybody else. I cannot imagine the fear that must go through people's minds when they are, don't have a faith in Christ Jesus. <laughs> What is that like? I don't want to know what that's like. We continue on. So we are in the kingdom. We are also, uh, there's an understanding. I want us to go over to Romans chapter 8 uh, right now and take a look at a passage there. Romans chapter 8. This is a fascinating uh, group of scriptures in Romans 8. We're just going to touch on a few of them. By being in Christ, notice what it says in verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. I don't know about you, but I find a lot of comfort there. You know, when, when we are in the face of, of such horrible things in this life and in the world, there's a lot of comfort there. To know that I can abide eternally as long as I'm abiding in Christ, everything's going to be fine. We're going to, we're going to come uh, across uh, uh, this. We're going to come out of this just fine. Uh, I have to tell you just uh, uh, for a moment. Uh, we were watching um, Apollo 13. You've seen that movie? If you haven't, it's a pretty good movie. It's about you know Apollo 13 when they had that right, right go figure <laughs> when they were going and they had that disastrous issue as they were going to the moon well they weren't able to to go and land there they they basically had a lot of trouble trying to get back they didn't know if they were going to make it and it's really a, a fascinating story if you'll take time to even just not look at the movie, but go and look at all the documentation with regard to that. It's fascinating that they actually ever made it back. And, uh, and as they were approaching um, 
approaching the time of when they were supposed to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, and there was some discussion by a couple of the, the I'll just use the term higher-ups, and they were talking about how, how terrible, you got, you got the, the sense that they were talking about how terrible this is going to be. It's going to be NASA's and America's greatest disaster. And then the, 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 the one in charge of the mission, I can't remember his name, but nevertheless he says, with all due respect, sir, I think this is going to be our greatest moment. Man, that hit me hard. You know, I was like, wow. You know, I, I've heard that a thousand times. But, you know, maybe, just maybe, for members of the body of Christ, this could be our, our greatest moment. In that we have a faith that we didn't let this, this rock us. We came together. And, uh, and that we were living our religion. We are abiding in Christ. And that uh, gives me a great sense of comfort. If you take a look at John chapter 17 verses 20 through 21, this is our Lord's prayer to God there uh, in that moment of trial. And what we gather there is that they were united together. You might take a look at John 17 verses 20 through 21. That's right, we're united together. Uh, we are um, maintaining this unity. If we take a look at Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. But you know, to abide in Christ not only means that we uh, dwell, that He dwells in us, that He continues in us, but it also means that we have to live for Him. Alright, so it is a walk of faith, uh, faith uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. In Romans chapter 1 verses 16 through 17, there we learn that it is a living by faith, not by sight. In Matthew chapter 22 verses 34 and following, there we are commanded to uh, love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? Uh, so with the element of serving Him, we are to serve Him, it says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 11, the idea of serving Him fervently. As we've already mentioned in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, we are to walk in the light. If that's not a work, I don't know what is. We are to continue to walk in the light or to abide in Him. Remember in John chapter 1 and verse 9, we were first introduced to the idea there that He was, as it says here, the true light. I don't know if you've noticed, but in the King James Version there, the word light is capitalized. There's a reason for that. He was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So we need to, we need to focus on the light. Remember where our faith is. Keep striving and abiding for that. Uh, we need to live worthy of our calling. As I said before, living our religion. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. And let's also not forget uh, that abiding means that we work for Him. Not only do we live for Him, but we work for Him. Obedience is required. Uh, John chapter 14 and verse 15, where Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. And so, you know, that's something that we need to do. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8. There it says that we are to abound in the work of the Lord. In fact, in Titus 2, 11 through 14, we understand there that we are to be zealous of good works. Now, I don't know about you, but when we keep the proper perspective and we keep our focus on the things that are before, pressing toward the mark, then all of this other distraction becomes a lot less to worry about. And so let's stay focused on the things that are before us. We need to be ready unto all good works, it says in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. That we need to be doers of the word, right? And need to be working, James chapter 1 and verse 22. Now, here's the key element, and this is where we're going to close. So we know what abiding in Christ means. We desire that. We want to abide in Christ because we want to abide forever. We don't want to let the world drag us down. And so we focus and we, uh, we do the things necessary to let Him abide in us, right? To live in us. And we know that abiding in Christ means to live for Him. To abide in Christ means to work for Him. But all of these blessings are only for those in Christ. And that's where we are with the one-up message. We're one-up. 
Because if you're a Christian, you know and you're prepared, like it says there in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Be faithful unto death. Now let's get back over to Romans chapter 8 for just a minute. I told you there was a couple of other things I wanted to make mention of there. Romans chapter 8. And let's start in verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, <clears throat> and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And Galatians chapter 5 pretty much uh, says something similar, that we need to walk after the Spirit, not the flesh. Uh, Galatians 5 verses 16 through 25. We know that there is hope in eternal life, or eternal life gives us hope, Titus 1 and verse 2. But let's turn over to uh, 2 Peter and read a verse that we have there, 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> and we're going to take a look at verses 5 through 11. It says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now, we, we are familiar with this passage. Sometimes we call this the, the uh, Christian attributes, the adding uh, section. Uh, now, if we keep this in the right perspective, that this is something that we are being vigilant about motivated about in that we're adding, we're thinking about continually growing in these areas. Now, if we add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that ties directly into what we were talking about in John 15 about not being barren and abiding, right? Look at verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. To me, this sounds like a person of fear. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. That's because we're too busy focusing on the more important things. So, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there again, if we keep the right perspective and we're focusing, uh, and then we're not going to let the fears of this world distract us. We're going to be just fine. And that doesn't mean we don't take precautions, right? I, I, we've talked about it here. Sanitizing, washing your hands. We're not saying throw all that away. By no means. But what we're talking about is don't get fanatically uh, torn up by the things that are going on and, and letting fear run how you, how you run your life, especially spiritually. Now, back over to Romans chapter 8 one more time. And then we will wrap up here. Romans chapter 8. And we've, we've read this time and time again, but I think today, just as much as ever, these things are important. When we talk about verses 35 through 39, it's just so applicable. And we will read it again. And we will read it every day if it helps us to stay focused. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? I might put in parentheses there. I don't mean to add to God's Word, but pestilence, virus, at least in context, we understand these things could these things won't separate us from Christ. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present or things to come, nor height or depth or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Be calm. Continue on. As long as we're doing what God would have us to do, we're going to be all right. Hey, keep in mind your, the necessary things for hygiene, of course. But spiritually speaking, we don't need to be worried uh, that uh, th what people are saying around us about is this the last times? It has been for a long time. We're waiting around for God to pull the switch. Uh, should we be worried about Antichrist, some kind of uh, crazy force? That, no, we don't need to worry about that. If we're grounded and settled in the truth, we're going to be able to. We're going to be more than conquerors. Isn't that what the scripture said? No powers or principalities. We don't worry about. It. We stay focused on what our duty is here today. And there's a great resolve and comfort in knowing that we have one another to help each other out. So I'm hoping that this message serves as a great deal of comfort for you. Let's just keep striving to abide in Christ Jesus. We know what that means and how we need to do it. Um, listen, if there's uh, somebody who's not yet a Christian that's here today of accountable age, we invite you to come uh, based on what Scripture says. Uh, there's no reason to fear death. Uh, as long as we're doing what God would have us to do, things are going to be fine. All right. If we are Christians, uh, and you know, sometimes we just we need prayers for strength. Things sometimes overwhelm us. Uh, that's that's normal being human. Uh, we're not going to throw any shame on you or ridiculousness because it happens, and we're going to wrap our arms around you, maybe figuratively, but we are going to secure you and say words that are comforting and encouraging to you, and we'll build you up. Because that's, that's what we're supposed to do. And give us that opportunity if we can assist you in any way. If you need prayers on your behalf, please let us know. I appreciate the songs that Ben's been leading because to me they are of a great comfort and they fit in with the message. So consider the, the words of this song and if you can respond to the Lord's invitation, please come. We stand and sing the song of encouragement.